Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7, Jesus goes up onto a mountain and he sits down to begin teaching the crowd. As he begins teaching the crowd, he informs them of some things that their way or line of thinking has followed. And many of those things he follows by giving them a new line of thinking, a new way and direction of living. Near the end of that sermon, Jesus strongly encouraged his listeners to obey his teachings. A series then of contrasting options are presented in Matthew chapter 7 with the understanding that each listener has to choose. It's not an option whether you choose. It's an option which way you choose. You are to choose one of two different ways or paths which lead to different destinations. Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. One leads to eternal life, the other leads to destruction. Jesus warned then against some false prophets pointing out two classes of trees and the fruit which each produces, verses 15 through 20. And he says you must choose what kind of tree you're going to be. You have to choose what kind of fruit you're going to produce. And you need to be aware that there are those who are false teachers who are going to be bad trees and produce bad fruit. Then he holds up two kinds of followers. He says one kind of follower will obey while the other kind of follower will not obey, verses 21 through 23. Then at the close of the sermon, Jesus contrasts two more options. These two options are that of two builders. These two types of builders are the ones we want to look at in more detail this evening. Matthew chapter 7, we begin reading in verse number 24. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against that house and yet it did not fall for it had been founded on the rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against that house and it fell and great was its fall. Both builders heard the words of Jesus. Both builders built a house. One man builds the house on the rock, the other man builds his house on the sand. And when the rain falls, the floods come and the winds blow and slam against the house, the house that is built upon the rock does not fall, but the house that is built upon the sand fails greatly. Jesus says one man may be compared to a wise man while the other will be like a foolish man. Fathers, we ask you this evening, is the house you are building being built on the Lord Jesus Christ? The house which we do indeed build will prove us to be wise or to be foolish. You see, it's a lot easier to be a foolish builder than a wise builder. We find many foolish builders in the scriptures. A foolish man builds on the sand that is unsettled. Eli was permissive in what he allowed his sons to do without giving correction. And so his sons, Hophni and Phinehas, were guilty of impiety, intimidation, and immorality, according to 1 Samuel chapter 2, beginning in verse 12. When Eli did attempt to correct his rebellious sons, 1 Samuel chapter 2, verses 23 through 25 revealed that it was too late. And so a prophet goes to Eli and warns him and his family of the consequences of the family's behavior. They would no longer serve as priests and Eli's two sons would die in the same day. Here is what the Lord told Samuel who would take Eli's place as spiritual leader in Israel. 1 Samuel chapter 3, beginning in verse 10. Then the Lord came and stood and called uh, as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. 
And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. The Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I am about to do a thing in Israel at which both ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. In that day I will carry out against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. For I have told him that I am about to judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knew because his sons brought a curse on themselves. And he did not rebuke them. Therefore, I have sworn to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or offering forever. Because Eli built his house on the unsettled sand of permissiveness, failing to rebuke his sons for their iniquity, both Hophni and Phinehas died in battle. 1 Samuel chapter 4, verses 10 and 11. And when the news of Israel's defeat in that battle, the deaths of his two sons and the capture of the Ark of the Covenant reached Eli, he fell from his seat, broke his neck, and died also. 1 Samuel chapter 4, verse 17 and 18. Don't be like Eli who built his house on sand that was unsettled. A foolish man builds on the sand of absence. King David's first son, Amnon, was a rapist, according to 2 Samuel chapter 13. Two chapters later, 2 Samuel chapter 15, Absalom usurped David's throne and slept with his father's wives. Adonijah conspired to take his brother Solomon's throne against the will of God, which was revealed through David, 1 Kings chapter 1. Solomon might well have been one of the ones who was the most wicked of David's sons. For in Deuteronomy chapter 17, verses 14 through 20, God had revealed certain laws, certain rules for each of the kings that would reign over his people. Solomon violated these laws, Deuteronomy chapter 17, beginning in verse 14. When you enter into the land which the Lord your God gives you, and you possess it and live in it, and you say, I will set a king over me like all the nations who are around me, you shall surely set a king over you whom the Lord, is God, the, whom the Lord your God chooses. One from among your own countrymen you shall set as king over yourselves. You may not put a foreigner over yourselves who is not your countryman. Moreover, he, the one who does rule, shall not multiply horses for himself, nor shall he cause the people to return to Egypt to multiply horses, since the Lord has said to you, You shall never again return that way. He shall not multiply wives for himself, or else his heart will turn away, nor shall he greatly increase silver and gold for himself. Now it shall come about when he sits on his throne of his kingdom, he shall write for himself a copy of the law on a scroll in the presence of the Levitical priest. It shall be with him, and he shall read it all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God by careful observance of all the words of this law and these statutes, that his heart may not be lifted up above his countrymen, and that he may not turn aside from the commandment to the right or to the left, so that he and his sons may continue long in his kingdom in the midst of Israel. Solomon's violation of these laws is later recounted in 1 Kings chapter 3 and verse 1 when Solomon goes down to Egypt and marries a wife from Egypt and additionally makes an alliance with Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Later in 1 Kings chapter 11 verses 1 through 8 record that Solomon loved many foreign wives and that these foreign wives turned his heart away from God. What we do not find in Scripture is any keeping of that law that he as king would write his own copy of the law. Solomon is never said to have done that. Much of these evils were committed because David built his house on the sand of absence. David left his sons to the care of the Hiram, the wives in the royal court. And thus Ammon went after his half-sister, 
the way David, his father, went after Bathsheba. Absalom promised the people a, a more justice society than his father was providing them. And Solomon started down that slippery slope, sacrificing and burning incenses on the high places and continued it up with even more pagan worship. Don't build your house on the sand of absence. A foolish man builds his house on the sand of lenience in his old age. Samuel was old, 1 Samuel chapter 8 and verse 1, when he appointed his sons to be judges over Israel. His sons did not walk in his ways, but turned aside after dishonest gain and took bribes and perverted justice, 1 Samuel 8 verse 3. So when the elders of Israel gathered themselves together and went to address Samuel about the behavior of his sons, they said, Behold, you have grown old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint a king for us to judge us like all the nations. 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 4 and 5. God instructed Samuel that the people would not rejected Samuel himself, but rather they had obje objected to and rejected God. But it was on the sand of old age that the faithful can grow lax in holding firm to God's teachings, doing God's will, instructing, correcting, and disciplining their children and even their grandchildren. Don't build your house on the sand of leniency in your old age. A foolish man builds on the sand of bad leadership. Ahaz was some 20 years old when he became king and he did not do what was right in the sight of the Lord his God. In 2 Kings chapter 20 or chapter 16, 2 Kings chapter 16 beginning in verse number 2, it is recorded 2 Kings chapter 16, I'll find the right passage in a moment. Verse 2, Ahaz was 20 years old when he became king and he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem and he did not do what was right in the sight of the Lord his God as his father David had done, but he walked in the ways of the kings of Israel and even made his son pass through the fire, an important phrase to keep in mind. He made his son pass through the fire according to the abominations of the nations whom the Lord had driven out from before the sons of Israel. He sacrificed and burned incense on the high places and on the hills and under every green tree. Ahaz sacrificed on pagan altars, even going as far as to offer his son as a sacrifice in pagan worship. He replaced the bronze altar in the temple with one modeled after a pagan altar. And then he rearranged some of the temple furnishings. 2 Kings chapter 16 beginning in verse 10 as it continues through verse 20. It was the prophet Ezekiel who would recount some of this information specifically in reference to the harlotry which Israel took part in as they worshipped these idols. Ezekiel chapter 16, beginning in verse number 19. God was speaking with them and He says, Also my bread, which I gave you, fine flour, oil, and honey, with which I fed you, you offer before them, the idols, for a soothing aroma, so it happened, declares the Lord God. Moreover, you took your sons and daughters whom you had borne to me and sacrificed them to idols to be devoured. Were your harlotry so small a matter? You slaughtered, your, my, you slaughtered my children and offered them up to idols by causing them to pass through the fire. So Israel fell. Israel fell because of its idolatry. Israel followed the leading of Ahaz and other bad kings as is reported in 2 Kings chapter 17 beginning in verse 16. 
God said that they forsook all the commandments of the Lord their God and made for themselves molten images, even two calves, and made an Asherah, and worshipped all the host of heaven and served Baal. Then they made their sons and their daughters pass through the fire and practiced divination and enchantments and sold themselves to do evil in the sight of the Lord, provoking Him. So the Lord was very angry with Israel and removed them from His sight. None was left except the tribe of Judah. So it was that Israel fell because she built herself on the sand of evil men, wicked customs, and a disrespect for God. Don't build your house on the sand of bad leadership. A foolish man rebuilds on the sand of mistakes. Hear the story of Manasseh, 2 Kings chapter 21, verses 1 through 9. Jeff shared this message with us just last week that must. Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king and he reigned 55 years in Jerusalem. 2 Kings chapter 21 beginning in verse 2. He did evil in the sight of the Lord according to the abominations of the nations whom the Lord dispossessed before the sons of Israel. For he rebuilt the high places which Hezekiah his father had destroyed. And he erected altars for Baal and made an Asherah as Ahab king of Israel had done and worshipped all the host of heaven and served them. For he built altars in the house of the Lord of which the Lord had said, In Jerusalem I will put my name. For he built altars for all the host of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. And he made his son pass through the fire. He practiced witchcraft and used divination and he dealt with the mediums and spiritists. He did much evil in the sight of the Lord, provoking him to anger. Then he set a carved image of Asherah that he had made in the house of which the Lord had said to David and to his son Solomon, In this house and in Jerusalem I have chosen from all the tribes of Israel. I will put my name forever and I will not make the feet of Israel wander any more from the land which I give to their fathers, if only they will observe to do according to all that I have commanded them and according to all the law that my servant Moses commanded. But, verse 9, they did not listen. And Manasseh seduced them to do evil more than the nations whom the Lord destroyed before the sons of Israel. Manasseh rebuilt what his father had torn down. Then he further built on the sands of Ahab, king of Israel, the sands of past mistakes and the sands of more evil. Don't build your house on the sand of mistakes like Manasseh did in building his. Yes, it is far easier to be a foolish builder than to be a wise builder, but there are wise builders which we see in Scripture. A wise man is concerned with his family as he builds his home. We encounter a ruler of the synagogue named Jairus in Mark chapter 5. This man disregarded some common prejudices and some common pride of his day to get the care for his daughter, care which she drastically needed. Jairus brought Jesus to his daughter because of her illness, according to Mark chapter 5, verses 22 through 24. The message continues in Mark chapter 5, verse 35. While he was still speaking, they came from the house of the synagogue official saying, Your daughter has died. Why trouble the teacher anymore? But Jesus, overhearing what was being spoken, said to the synagogue official, Do not be afraid any longer. Only believe. And he allowed no one to accompany him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. They came to the house of the synagogue official 
and he saw a commotion and people loudly weeping and wailing. And he entering in said to them, Why make a commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but is asleep. They began laughing at him. But putting them all out, he took along the child's father and mother and his own companions and entered the room where the child was. Taking the child by the hand, he said to her, Talitha Kuma, which translated means little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl got up and began to walk for she was 12 years old. And immediately they were completely astonished. Jairus knew that Jesus was the only one who could heal his daughter. Trouble at home should not deter fathers from believing and being faithful to Jesus. Commotions around the home should not distract them from following God. Being mocked by outsiders should not hinder one from following after God. Jairus was concerned for his daughter, so he went and sought out Jesus, then brought Jesus to his family. A wise builder turns to Christ for help and brings Christ to all who are in his house. A wise man gains respect as he builds. The first mention of one named Jonadab is when in Act in 2 Kings chapter 10, Jehu is destroying the wicked family of Ahab. Jehu's endeavors take him to Samaria, and as he's going to Samaria to finish killing off Ahab's relatives, he meets Jonadab. Jonadab is presented with what Jehu is doing, and Jonadab gives his hand to destroy this idolatry as well. Jonadab took a stand against evil. Jonadab, furthermore, gave commands to his sons, and they obeyed him, and his commands were handed down to further generations who did likewise. Jeremiah chapter 35, Jeremiah tells of his encounter with Rechab's family. Jonadab's father is Rechab. In Jeremiah chapter 35, beginning in verse 5, Jeremiah said, Then I set before the men of the household of the Rechabites, pitchers full of wine and cups. And I said to them, Drink wine. But they said, We will not drink wine, for Jonadab, the son of Rechab, our father, commanded us, saying, You shall not drink wine, you or your sons, forever. You shall not build a house, and you shall not sow seed, and you shall not plant a vineyard, or own one. But in the tents you shall dwell all your days, that you may live many days in the land where you sojourn. We have obeyed the voice of Jonadab, the son of Rechab, our father, in all that he commanded us, not to drink wine all our days, we, our wives, our sons, or our daughters, nor to build for ourselves houses to dwell in, and we do not have vineyards or field or seed. We have only dwelt in tents and have obeyed and have done according to all that Jonadab, our father, commanded us. But when Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up against the land, we said, Come and let us go to Jerusalem before the army of the Chaldeans and before the army of the Arameans. So we have dwelt in Jerusalem. The obedience of Rechab's descendants, specifically those who followed Jonadab, was so great that Jeremiah the prophet was then encouraged to use them as an example in reproving the people of Judah. Notice Jeremiah 35, beginning in verse 12. Then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Go and say to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, Will you not receive instruction by listening to my words, declares the Lord? 
The words of Jonadab, the son of Rechab, which he commanded his sons not to drink wine, are observed. So they do not drink wine to this day, for they have obeyed their father's command. But I have spoken to you again and again, yet you have not listened to me. Because of the obedience of Jonadab's sons and later generations, God blessed the Rechabites according to Jeremiah 35 beginning in verse 18. Then Jeremiah said to the house of the Rechabites, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, because you have obeyed the command of Jonadab your father, kept all his commands, and done according to all that he commanded you, therefore thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Jonadab the son of Rechab shall not lack a man to stand before me always. Fathers must stand against evil. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 11. They must instruct their children, garnering obedience from their children, and ensure that the same great lessons are passed on to the next generation. A wise builder gains respect by his obedience to God, his instruction to his children, and his discipline of passing on such obedience to future generations. Be a wise builder. Be a wise builder who gains respect as he builds. A wise man comes back to build correctly. Manasseh was a very wicked king. He plunged Israel deeper into sin than the nations whom the Lord destroyed before the sons of Israel. 2 Chronicles 33 and verse 9. The next verse says that God warned Manasseh and the Israelites of the consequences that would come upon them because of their sins. They did not heed the Lord, however, Thus God fulfilled His warnings by sending them away into captivity. 2 Chronicles 33 verses 12 and 13 tell that Manasseh in captivity humbled himself. He learned from his mistakes. And he may have learned from the mistakes of others as well. Therefore God mercifully allowed Manasseh to return home and to return to his throne. Manasseh then, verses 14 through 16, made efforts to correct the wrongs he had done, but he could not erase the influence which he had already had on his own son, Ammon, who continued in greater and greater evils, 2 Chronicles 33 and verse 23. It was Manasseh, who lived to regret the sinful ways in which he built his house. Because sin brings a bitter harvest, sin often brings that bitter harvest in this life, but certainly in eternity. Manasseh was foolish in building his house. But after going away into captivity, he was humbled by God, and was allowed to return. And in his rebuilding, he built correctly. A wise builder does not leave his children to ruin once he sees that he has failed his children. Rather, he goes back and builds again. He builds correctly. Because a foolishly built house leads to ruin, regret, and renovations, but a house wisely built leads to greater construction, joy, and refreshment. So all of man is encouraged to build their house on the Lord Jesus Christ, believing God's message, John 8, 24, repenting of sins, Luke 13, 3, confessing Jesus, Matthew 10, verse 32, and being baptized, Acts chapter 22 and verse 16. And then that one who has built his house is to continue to live faithfully, 
Continue to seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Matthew 6 and verse 33. So that His children will do the same and His grandchildren can be influenced in just the same way. A house not built on the rock will have to be built again. Because a house built on unsettled sand of permissiveness will be troubled. A house built on absence will be found empty. A house built in the leniency of old age will have no definite shape to it. A house built on bad leadership will collapse And a house built on mistakes will have even more blunders. But a house built upon the rock will stand for eternity. A house built on concern that every family member encounter Jesus. A house built on respect for God and every person who enters it is taught to respect God. A house that is built upon repentance and forgiveness and corrections will stand for all eternity. Be a wise builder, Matthew chapter 7 verse 24. Be the wise builder of which Jesus said is the one who hears the words of Jesus and acts upon them. Be a wise builder. Hear the words of Jesus this evening and act upon them right now as together we stand and sing.